the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So rarely, if ever, have I been disappointed when somebody has said, you need to check out this TED Talk, you know, those short, about 20-minute uh, video uh, segments of somebody speaking about something they're particularly gifted in or, or have studied or are passionate about. Um, and this is too true of uh, one that was recommended recently uh, about a woman, Chimanda Adichie. She is a Nigerian writer, uh, short story writer, fiction writer, and she's talking about the real ills of a single story, of classifying or grouping anybody by a single story. She tells her story. She grew up in Lagos, Nigeria, in a university town. Her dad was a professor. Her mom worked for the university. Uh, she grew up in a middle-class environment. And uh, according to her parents, she was a voracious reader. Her parents say she started at two years old. She's guessing more like four. Uh, but she would read anything she could get her hands on. And she describes uh, the literature. And she said there were always these lily white characters. Uh, and she described the weather seemed to be a very important uh, aspect of these stories. It was always uh, 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 caked in snow or, uh, or fall leaves falling down. And uh, they were always handed something like an apple. Uh, all of these totally novel to uh, uh, an African woman in Lagos, Nigeria, or an African girl in, in Lagos, Nigeria. But she thought that's what filled all the pages of literature. Uh, that the stories that made their way into literature uh, were about uh, lily white people half a world away with weather she couldn't imagine, with fruits she never tasted, uh, until later in life when she was exposed uh, to African uh, uh, and, and other uh, forms of literature that had characters that looked like her, uh, that ate mangoes, uh, uh, that didn't talk about the weather because the weather was fairly much the same day after day. Uh, and she said that's what possessed her to become a writer, that her story opened up uh, and that she saw so many layers uh, to, to the people that end up in literature. She also talked about uh, the ways that she'd been guilty of creating a single story. Uh, she talks uh, about uh, this gentleman, this young boy uh, who was their houseboy, uh, who lived with them, uh, and um, all that she ever knew about this boy was that he was poor. Uh, that's, what his, that's how her parents described him. Uh, he's poor. His family's poor. They're incredibly poor. Uh, that was the limited and narrowing narrative uh, that she had for this individual. And uh, one day, uh, as she had a couple years of being with him, uh, she went to his house and was shocked to find out that uh, his brother was one of the most gifted basket uh, weavers that she had ever seen and made the most beautiful baskets uh, and, and found out a whole lot of other things about, about this family, a, a, a depth and richness to their story uh, that was not uh, in her purview because all she knew, her one story about this uh, a person who spent a good bit of his life in her house was that he was poor, that Jimmy was poor. She said uh, she also experienced that in the, other, uh, in the other direction when she went off to college. She went to the States uh, to college, and uh, she uh, was with a roommate, and her roommate asked her, you know, you speak such perfect English. Uh, she pointed out, you know the national language of Nigeria is English, uh, to which uh, the roommate was quite surprised. It said, uh, then the roommate, you know, uh, trying, not, uh, trying to be helpful and trying to learn a little bit more, uh, said, well, can you play me some music from, uh, from your childhood? Uh, expecting uh, uh, something with, 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 with tribal rhythms. And when uh, Mariah Carey gets put on the CD, uh, she was totally shocked. Uh, and I have to admit, I had a similar uh, encounter uh, in seminary. One of my uh, good friends uh, was from uh, Lagos as well. And he went home to Nigeria uh, uh, to, to bury his dad. And he came back and he said, uh, he said, Ben, I have a gift for you. And I was expecting something, you know, uh, a mask or a, a drum or, or some robes because he had some, some uh, beautiful African robes. Uh, and he uh, got me a pair of very tight size 29 black jeans. Uh, <laughs> not at all what I was expecting. Uh, but a reminder that sometimes we paint with a narrow story. Uh, and when we paint with a singular story, we flatten people. We don't respect fully the dignity of every human being. Uh, and no matter who we are, whenever our views or our backgrounds or any characteristic of us uh, is put into a singular story and we're defined by that, uh, we feel limited. We feel narrow. Scorpion, hold on to that story. 
Another story, I was uh, studying uh, up in New Haven, and I had the most typical looking uh, uh, Ivy League professor. He had, uh, in the middle of winter, Birkenstocks with thick wool socks, a uh, thick beard and long hair, and, 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 and sort of one, even one of those, you know, the coats with the, with the, uh, uh, with the, the patches over the shirt. And he came in sort of uh, disheveled, and he talked about his earlier life as a missionary. And he said, uh, he said, I've done a lot of good work, and he said, I've done a lot of work I'm not very proud of as a missionary. Uh, and he talked about going to this place in Papua New Guinea. And he said, I am almost positive I wasn't just the only white person to ever end up in this community. I think I was the only person not born in this community to ever end up in this community. And he said, our group of people, we, we came, uh, we, we had the gospel in hand, the teachings of the church, uh, and uh, all of the wisdom of the Western world, and we were going to change their lives. Um, and we're going to change their lives by giving them the gospel. We're going to change their lives by improving uh, the lives they lived. And I uh, said, so we found this community, and because of the deep woods, uh, it was incredibly isolated. It was very difficult to even get there. Uh, and they somehow got there, and they said they actually even lived above the ground in the trees. They, they created a, a village in the trees. Uh, and it says that they got to know the folks. They realized uh, what a burden that was placed upon the women. The women had to walk miles and miles uh, up, uh, uphill to the water source. And they had to carry uh, these enormous uh, vessels to, uh, to go and they get the water and they bring the water back. And a good bit of their day was spent uh, going up to the water source. And, then, and they realized since it was uphill that they could irrigate the water right into the town. Uh, and said so with the, everybody living in the trees, there was no worry about flooding or anything. So they uh, used modern ingenuity and they uh, irrigated all of the water into the town. Uh, they gave them the gospel. They gave them everything they needed. Uh, and then they left figuring they had saved this community. Uh, and they came back a couple years later. Uh, and he said, you know, we, 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 we love being back there. They welcomed us with open arms. Uh, they talked about how much the gospel had meant in their lives. Uh, and then said, you know, after a few days of talking, they realized, they said, well, there is something we're noticing about our women. They're not as happy as they used to be. They didn't even have a word for depressed. Uh, and they started uh, exploring it a little more. And they said, well, you know, they, they don't have to go down to the water or up to the water. So the combination of, of walking a uh, 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 the exercise of walking, uh, the community that gathered around the, the, the watering source uh, to collect water, to share the stories of the day, the sense of purpose that came from going and gathering the water, all of that uh, was integral to their happiness and their sense of, 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 of self and their sense of being connected to another person. Uh, and so when that was taken away, uh, they suffered for the first time uh, that their community knew uh, what was we would call depression. Hold on to that story, too. And now the gospel, which is one of the richest gospel stories uh, in the Bible. I think this story has so many layers uh, that I could spend well over two hours talking about it, but I'll cut that in half. Uh, so uh, uh, maybe a little bit more. Uh, so first, remember where we were last week. Jesus uh, uh, was visited by Nicodemus in the dark of night. Uh, and I talked about how uh, the thing that Jesus knew that was holding Nicodemus back, was keeping him from being able to jump in uh, and follow Jesus, uh, was that he would have to put his lottery ball, the, that winning lottery ball that, uh, that said Nicodemus was born of the right family, was born of the right tribe, uh, was a religious leader. As far as being in the Jewish community, he was at the top of the heap, and he'd have to put that ball back into the hopper to follow Jesus. Uh, and just like the rich man, we realized that he left uh, uh, the house and, uh, and didn't give up his day job. Uh, it wasn't until he witnessed the cross that he, uh, that he was willing uh, to come out of the shadows and acknowledge uh, what he'd seen in Jesus Christ. Uh, and he goes from that story to a uh, period of time baptizing with John in the, uh, 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 in the Jordan. And then um, after that, uh, the Pharisees are coming because they're hearing about all of this uh, work that's being done. And they're a little concerned about it. So Jesus, not wanting to have a run-in with the Pharisees, leaves by another way. And he has to go through the bad part of town, through the Samaritans. And the Samaritans are not just the wrong side of the tracks. Uh, they're not just a different tribe. They are the sworn enemy of the Israelites, largely because they have so much in common. Uh, the Samaritans are essentially Israelites, uh, and they have uh, a couple differences. Uh, one, uh, and it goes back 600 years before Jesus, uh, during the, the Babylonian exile or Babylonian captivity, uh, the 
a higher echelon uh, uh, Israelites, the ones who lived in Jerusalem, were run out of town. They were imprisoned and they were, uh, 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 and they were exiled, essentially. Uh, but those that were the rural uh, Israelites, they got to stay. Uh, and those were the Samaritans. And so they stayed and, uh, and, and they developed their own uh, ideas. They used the same sacred text, but they focused on, on, on different, uh, more on the prophets and on some of the different elements of it. Uh, and they also married outside of the tribe. Uh, and, and integrated some other ideas. And they also uh, had this belief that Mount Gerizim uh, was the Holy of Holies, was the place where God resided uh, and not the Temple Mount. Um, and so when she's questioning Jesus about uh, you, uh, you're an Israelite, you think Jesus, God re re uh, lives in Jerusalem, we think God lives on top of that mountain right there. Um, uh, that's what she's talking about. And it was uh, pretty neat to have been uh, there just in the past year to see the two mountains uh, uh, in the horizon together. Uh, so Jesus heads into Samaria and he runs into this woman. Straight at the well, straight at noon. We know a couple things. One, how many of us, if you were honest with yourself, uh, have heard this story before? And if you've heard this story before, how many of you assume this woman is sinful? Assume that this is a broken woman uh, who has sinned greatly. Most of you assume that because that's the way the story has been presented. But what has this woman done wrong? When you think about it, what has this woman done wrong? Well, somebody else also thinks she's a little less than because she is gathering water at noon, at the height uh, of the sun, of the hottest time of the day. Uh, and we know from the geography of it that she's not even gathering water from the nearest watering hole to her village. She is actually walking past that to go to the next town over, and she's going at high noon. Remember the story about the depressed women? Uh, she is intentionally drawing water uh, when no one else is going to be around. And she's asking Jesus later on, uh, is there a way that I never have to draw water again? She's going at high noon so she doesn't run into anybody she knows. And she's going to another village just to make sure she doesn't run to, into anyone she knows because she's been stigmatized. Why has she been stigmatized? Well, Jesus says, you've been stigmatized because you've been married five times and the person that you're living with is not your husband. Even if this was because she was the worst wife ever, even if it was because she was unfaithful, even if it was because of all of the myriad of sins that could have, uh, that, that could have coalesced into, into this reality, is she still unworthy of community? Is she still unworthy of God, of people talking to her, engaging her, of being a whole person? But let's go back to the first century. You don't get divorced because of all those things. You get divorced predominantly uh, because either uh, you are un, uh, unfaithful or more likely because you are barren. So let's assume she can't have children. Or she's been widowed. We don't know that. She may have been widowed five times. Either she's been widowed or she is infertile. Neither of which are of her own doing. Uh, yet because she's landed on her feet five different times, uh, she's been stigmatized by this community. So Jesus comes in at high noon, in the light of day, and she goes, he goes to the well, and he engages this woman who is a sworn enemy because she's a Samaritan, and who is a woman who is having to draw water at the height of the day, at the hottest point of the day, because nobody wants to be in community with her. So everything says to Jesus, stay away from this woman. She has nothing to offer is not a vessel of goodness or the gospel, and yet Jesus goes straight towards her and engages her. She is a foreigner. She is a notorious woman. And she is a sworn enemy of the Israelites. And yet Jesus goes straight up to her and engages her. And Jesus starts talking to her uh, and says, do you want water that can last forever? Do you want water that can do more than, uh, than then wet your thirst. You want water that can actually give your life meaning and wholeness that can sustain you and lift you up so that you don't have to lean on all of these men for your support. Do you want the kind of grace uh, that can be spilled out and never run dry? She presses him a little bit. Do you want a God that isn't uh, confined to your mountain or my mountain, a God that runs free and works in each one of our lives? Do you want to be set free? And you know what? Unlike the rich man, I'm like Nicodemus. She leaves her watering container. She leaves her watering jar and goes and becomes the first evangelist to the Samaritan people. 
spreads the gospel over the divides. You know, when we narrow somebody's story, when we give her a singular story, we pull the dignity, the God that resides in her. What God calls us to do is to look at the wholeness of each individual, to look at people the way that God does. One of the things I tell the children uh, that respect means is to look again. Spectacle, re, to look again with God's eyes. Jesus looked upon this person and saw an evangelist. Saw somebody who understood. And this is the longest engagement Jesus has with anybody in the whole of Scripture. And it's with a foreigner who's been married five times, who's a woman in the middle of the day. And she becomes one of the most effective evangelists in the history of the church. Because when she hears the gospel, she knows it's true. And she has nothing to lose. And so she leaves her jar, drinks of the living water, and spills it out for others.